Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Jim Ostrowski and I work in Eagles Environmental Support Division. And I welcome you to our public information meeting tonight. It's an update on the Edenville Dam upcoming stabilization project. Uh, glad to see so many people could join us today. We've got uh, about 270 logged in right now and I think we're gonna get quite a few more logged in as we get started here. I just wanna run through a couple housekeeping guidelines. Uh, first of all, Hopefully you notice this, you're all muted. It means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Um, I'll talk about how to ask questions in just a moment. Just to let you know, we are recording this webinar meeting and we'll be posting it uh, as soon as we can uh, after after the meeting and uh, we'll let you know when, and when that happens in case you wanna pass it along to someone else. Uh, during the meeting tonight, if you wanna ask a question, there's a couple different ways you can do that. You can, on your Zoom toolbar, you can click on your Q&A box and type your question there and we'll read it off after the presentations. Uh, if you'd like to voice your question, you can click the raise hand icon. And what that'll do is tells us you got your hand raised and we'll call on you and unmute your mic so you can ask your question. Uh, we've got several people on the phone tonight, so phone only. Uh, if you're on the phone and you have a question, you just hit star nine and what that does is tells us you have a question on the phone and we will call on you by your phone number and you can ask your question that way. So those are my housekeeping guidelines. Uh, we've got lots of good uh, presenters here today to do some presentations from Eagle, uh, MDOT and AECOM. We also got some panelists here from Eagle, our team here at Eagle and uh, be willing to answer questions after we're done with our presentation. Uh, before our first presentation, I wanna turn it over to uh, the Water Resource Division's Director Teresa Seidel. Teresa, you there? I am. Okay. Good evening. Come on. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this public information meeting. The May 19th Edenville Dam failure caused catastrophic impacts to the residents and natural resources in mid Michigan. The Michigan Department of Eagle, Great Lakes, Environment greatly, and the Michigan Transportation with the engineering firm AECOM to assess the remaining structure for a risk of secondary dam failure during flood events. That study and a review of alternative project designs resulted in the project plan you're going to hear tonight. At this evening's meeting, Eagle and AECOM staff will be discussing the findings of the study and the details of a project that will be undertaken over the next several months to reduce the risk of a second dam failure. The project that will, that will be carried out will result in increased safety for the downstream residents and the restoration of a portion of the downstream natural resources that were damaged by the initial dam failure. I'm sure many of you joined tonight, tonight's meeting to gain knowledge and as to why the dam and as to why and when the dams will be, be rebuilt. Tonight we will not be discussing the future or fate of the dams that were in the May 19th event. Very simply, we can't. There are many legal actions that are ongoing and need to occur before those conversations can begin. But please understand that if we are able to, we will begin that conversation with the appropriate parties, reach out to you again and have further conversations. And we'll be discussing the future of the dams as they stand today. We don't know what's in the future. We we'll have a lot of legal actions still need to occur. And until those things are resolved, we really can't have those conversations. But tonight we do wanna provide you with the plan that we put together that we'll be undertaking to ensure the structure that remains does so in a safe manner. I just wanna thank you for joining us tonight. I know there are many other things you'd rather be doing with your evening, but the fact that you're here tonight shows your interest and your concern and, and we're grateful for that. So I'm gonna turn it back to Jim and so that we can keep going with the presentation and get to your questions in the end. Thank you. All right, thanks, Teresa. So with that, we're going to turn it over to our first presenter tonight, uh, Dan Devon. Dan, are you there? Yes, thanks, Jim. All right, you can go ahead and share your screen if you'd like. Yep. <clears throat> All right, so to start with, I guess I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Dan Devon. I am the uh, dam safety engineer for uh, this region of Michigan. Um, and so, uh, as Teresa has alluded to, we're going to be specifically talking about the uh, emergency actions that we're going to be taking out at uh, the Edenville Dam uh, over the winter here. 
So um, first want to kind of, you know, familiarize ourselves with the site and kind of talk about uh, uh, what exactly occurred um, on the date of the failure. Uh, so looking at a, a pre-failure uh, aerial image here, um, this large embankment is the Edenville Dam. Uh, there are two separate river systems uh, that are encompassed within this uh, impoundment and within this dam system. Uh, and so that includes the Titabawassee River side, uh, which is on the east, and the Tobacco River side, which is on the west. Uh, other key pieces of infrastructure um, associated with this site are the M30 Causeway Bridge, which connected the two uh, impoundments. And uh, there's also the South M30 Bridge, uh, which is crossing the Titabawassee River downstream of the dam. So, on May 19th, when the dam failed, uh, the breach occurred on the far east uh, end of the embankment um, through an earthen section. Uh, that led to a rapid dewatering of Wixom Lake on the uh, Titabawassee side of the impoundment. Uh, with that drawdown of the impoundment on the Titabawassee side, that caused a diversion of flow of the Tobacco River uh, through the causeway. Uh, which lowered the tobacco side uh, sub subsequently to where it was no longer sending water through the spillway. Uh, it also ultimately led to the collapse of the M30 bridge over the causeway. So following the failure, um, uh, there's a myriad of uh, activity that's occurred from Eagles Dam Safety Program uh, in response to the failure and the overall flood event. Um, to start with, uh, Eagle initially went out and began inspecting uh, impacted dams post flooding. Uh, so that included the, the facilities that were along the uh, Titabawassee and Tobacco Rivers, as well as uh, some other uh, dams and other watersheds that were impacted. Uh, pretty rapidly also, we uh, began communi compliance communications with uh, the owner of the dam, Boyce Hydro, uh, ordering them to perform engineering analyses, inspections, and then uh, ultimately implement mitigation measures to address any uh, concerns or issues that might be present at the dam. Um, after that, uh, there were several other communications, uh, including uh, uh, the requirement from both Eagle and FERC to hire an independent forensic investigation team. Uh, and then in June, um, there came uh, court proceedings in which there were court orders uh, for Boyce Hydro to perform uh, these engineering inspections and analyses. Uh, there were due dates associated with the court orders, uh, which uh, included a June 19 uh, preliminary or initial report, and then a comprehensive report that was due, due at the end of July. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the requirements of the July 24th uh, report were not met. So following, um, uh, following these orders or, or basically when uh, uh, sufficient analyses were not completed, uh, Eagle began to move into an emergency order process uh, where uh, due to the concerns that we still had over the remaining structure, um, we, we notified Boyce Hydro that, they would be, uh, that we would be performing the engineering investigations uh, in, in addressing some of the concerns uh, and then immediately uh, pursued uh, bringing on an engineering consultant to uh, perform those analyses and investigations. Uh, and so in order to achieve that, Eagle was able to partner uh, with MDOT and utilize one of their contracts uh, to uh, utilize the engineering services from AECOM. One of the first things we had AECOM do was to go out and uh, do an assessment of the, uh, basically the condition of the dam and the risks associated with that dam. Uh, and one of the things that we found very quickly was uh, there were some significant concerns over the hydraulic capacity of the remaining uh, structure and, and system. And with that also uh, concerns about the structural stability of the remaining embankment. Um, one of the key things to note is on the tobacco side, while it did lower its water, water elevation, uh, it was still maintaining about 30 feet of depth within that impoundment. Uh, so a pretty significant 
uh, volume of water that was being retained behind that structure. Um, in addition to these concerns about the hydraulic capacity and structural stability, there were also uh, ongoing impacts to natural resources and uh, transportation. Um, as far as natural resources go, the um, downstream reaches of the Tobacco River, uh, a little over a mile, uh, was basically left dry, uh, as well as uh, about 2,500 feet of the Titabuasi River uh, had been cut off. Ultimately, through these analyses, it was determined that the spring flows um, uh, that could be experienced um, in 2021 uh, could put the dam at an elevated uh, risk of a potential secondary failure on the tobacco spillway or the tobacco side of the dam. Uh, and so that's led to uh, the impetus to implement these emergency actions. So following these, this kind of initial assessment um, in August, uh, late August, AECOM had submitted an alternatives analysis to address these issues. Um, and then September 17th, uh, Eagle issued an emergency order uh, requesting that Boyce Hydro complete the design and construction of the selected alternative. Um, however, given communications that we had previously had uh, with the owners, uh, it, it was uh, fairly clear that uh, Eagle was going to have to take uh, these actions themselves. Uh, so uh, we uh, very quickly moved to um, issuing a request for qualifications for contractors uh, for construction um, as we were progressing through the design phase. And then uh, on no November 4th, we received bids for construction. And then moving forward, we are currently anticipating um, a start of construction could be as early as November 19th. Um, and then we're anticipating that substan substantial completion uh, of the modification project will be uh, on February 15th, so prior to spring flows. So kind of stepping back, looking at the alternatives that were considered for uh, mitigation measures. Uh, we considered four different alternatives uh, in this process. Uh, first alternative was looking at a full breach of the dam uh, by means of demolishing the existing concrete spillway. Uh, the second option looked at modification of the existing concrete spillway uh, in an effort to lower the impoundment level. Excuse me. Uh, the third alternative looked at a full breach of the dam embankment uh, through the earthen portion of the embankment. And then finally, the uh, last alternative looked at rehabilitation of the dam embankment uh, in order to meet current dam safety standards and then reestablishing flow uh, to the Tobacco River. Uh, each, each of these uh, alternatives was scored based on uh, the uh, various uh, uh, risk categories that are identified here. Uh, so looking at um, Things like safety, uh, minimizing loss of resources, um, designing construction schedule, um, post, op post construction operation and maintenance and monitoring, uh, the risk during construction, uh, risk reduction uh, based on previous probable failure mode uh, analyses, and then uh, finally public stakeholder and perception. Um, one of the key things that I really want to point out here is we were looking at all of these alternatives. Uh, our goal here was, you know, obviously first and foremost to address uh, safety concerns, making sure that uh, what we walked away from would minimize public safety uh, risk, public safety risk. And then in addition to that, trying to minimize the impacts uh, that this project might realize. Um, aside from just uh, the dam safety. So as we move through the scoring, uh, we had kind of a, um, uh, just a, a straight scoring, which identified alternative B, which was a modified or a modification of the uh, spillway on the tobacco side. We also then looked at skewing uh, the scoring based on, or weighting the scoring based on several different factors, which uh, looked at safety, design and construction schedule, um, operation and maintenance, and then construction risk. And we, we found pretty uh, resoundedly that um, alternative B was definitely the 
uh, preferred alternative. Uh, it is worth noting that alternative D, which looked at fully rehabilitating uh, the, the dam and maintaining uh, the impoundment level or even potentially raising the impoundment level, uh, did not meet uh, several of the goals of the project and most notably is the schedule. Uh, it was not uh, feasible to um, achieve uh, substantial completion of that project prior to spring runoff when we would be at an elevated risk of uh, failure for the dam. Um, so therefore, uh, you know, that, that wasn't really a viable solution. So as I mentioned, alternative B ended up being the uh, preferred alternative, uh, provide the greatest amount of flexibility in um, uh, managing the, the water levels within the, the remaining impoundment. Um, it it uh, aligns with MDOT's design goals for the M30 causeway uh, and um, uh, it uh, uh, would allow us to um, uh, also incorporate future design goals or future construction goals should the impoundment uh, be uh, reconstructed in the future. Um, and most importantly, uh, this can be completed in a timely manner. So to step through kind of the uh, course uh, design here, uh, the first step of this process would be restoring the river channel on the downstream side of the uh, spillway. Uh, the river channel had been filled in um, at a couple of times uh, in the last decade or so, and then uh, post failure in order to facilitate access uh, uh, it was filled in further. Uh, so we'll be restoring that channel. Um, we also will be looking to stabilize the walls and energy dissipation at the um, uh, spillway structure. Oops, oh, sorry. Uh, starting to get away from me there. Uh, we'll also be lowering the uh, spillway crest, um, as I mentioned, so modifying that structure uh, such that we can lower uh, the tobacco impoundment and restore flow to the river. Uh, that will then allow us to divert flow away from uh, the M30 causeway with the lowering of that uh, impoundment level. Uh, and then we'll be installing uh, upstream stabilization measures um, as necessary. So as, as we monitor and observe uh, changes uh, to the bottom lands within the impoundment, if we see any uh, significant stability issues, we can address those. And then subsequently, uh, while uh, this work is being completed, MDOT will also be working on installing a temporary bridge uh, for the M30 causeway. On the Titabawasi side, uh, this will be what we're calling our phase two of the project. Uh, and so this will actually be uh, uh, delayed um, till probably spring or possibly summer. Uh, and that will include removing sediment and debris from the channel downstream uh, of the failure. Uh, and then demolishing um, uh, or selectively demolishing uh, the spillway in order to restore flow to the river channel and uh, thereby diverting flow away from the breach. So unfortunately with, with anything, um, it, you know, there are, there are impacts and, um, you know, we do take these impacts from this project very seriously. Uh, as many of you are aware, um, as a result of the uh, dam failure and uh, the overall flood, uh, there were a significant number of uh, wells that have been impacted within Gladwin and Midland counties. Uh, to date, there's been roughly 350 wells uh, impacted um, in the vicinities of uh, Seacord, Smallwood, uh, Wixom, and uh, Sanford Lakes. Um, Generally, what we have found is that uh, wells that have actually gone dry uh, predominantly have been shallow wells that are within a quarter mile of the impoundment. Um, and so as we look at implementing a project that is going to further dewater the tobacco uh, side of the impoundment, um, you know, shallow wells within that, that uh, region could be uh, at risk uh, of running dry. Um, if any issues do arise, uh, we recommend that you reach out to your county emergency manager. Um, I know those individuals have been heavily engaged uh, with residents uh, when well issues are uh, occurring and they'll definitely be able to uh, help you out and point you in the right direction. 
The other potential impact that we're, we are concerned about is uh, potential erosion associated with dewatering the impoundment. Um, this graphic, what you see here, kind of outlines uh, different water levels within the impoundment. Uh, the purple outline is the pre-failure uh, impoundment uh, area. Uh, and so, um, you know, everybody's familiar with that. Uh, the green outline is the post-failure uh, condition. So what we essentially are seeing right now, uh, and basically this outline uh, or, or this impoundment extent uh, stops a, a little ways downstream of Dale Road. Um, after the uh, project is completed, uh, we will end up uh, with an impoundment that is essentially represented by this uh, yellow outline. Um, obviously upstream of this, there will still be a river. Um, and like I said, through Dale Road and for about a mile downstream, that uh, shouldn't really experience much in the way of changes. Uh, but downstream of there, we could see, or we will see some contracting of the impoundment and uh, we will be watching those areas for uh, potential stabilization concerns uh, as the bottom, bottom lands become exposed. So with that, I'm gonna actually turn it over and uh, let Paul Perry, our design engineer from AECOM, uh, cover the uh, details of the design. Thanks, Dan. So good evening, everyone. So I wanna start out and just briefly go through our design approach. Really, we wanted to take is you know basically reduce the risk of failure during large flow events. So we looked at different lowering elevations of of the spillway to achieve that. Um, ultimately, protect human life and property, and then uh, protect the natural resources of, uh, in this case, the Tobacco River uh, downstream. So our goals were to reduce the risk of failure during large flow events. This was, uh, this was achieved by lowering the spillway to a level of basically elevation 647, which I'll get into in a little bit, uh, which allows for uh, spill or return events, you know, your 100 year event, your 200 year event, to safely pass through the spillway uh, with uh, leaving enough of the dam embankment that is that that the the water does not reach in in uh, basically could result in overtopping of the of the uh, embankment itself. Protect human life and property uh, again by lowering this water level and then the subsequent uh, rise in the water level as a result of a storm event, we reduce that uh, potential of failure. And then finally protect natural resources, basically restoring normal flows through the Tobacco River down to the confluence of the Titabawassee uh, was very important. So we're looking at basically one main area, and I don't know if you can see, uh, you probably can't see my cursor move because <laughs> Dan, you're controlling. Sorry about that. Um, so we're going to be focusing all of our construction efforts at the tobacco spillway at the center of your screen. We'll have a significant staging area to the east. And then our probably our main entrance into the construction will be from the west. Um, we will also have to access probably a little bit from the M30 uh, with some equipment as we, as we move through different activities. Next slide. So this is a slide that shows the tobacco spillway up through the middle, which is a basically a, a concrete structure that extends through the, the embankment and that's that really gives us the advantage to use uh, the existing spillway structure to uh, effectively design a lowered uh, weir concept or a spillway concept. Uh, there was damage to the left and the right of the spillway downstream uh, with scour that will be 
regrading that and restoring that to its original lines and grades of the embankment, which will increase the stability in that area. And then we'll also be restoring the flow downstream, as Dan mentioned earlier, we'll be removing a lot of uh, fill that was placed by, by others and uh, reestablishing that flow with um, channel protection. Next slide. So this is a, a, a cross-sectional view of our proposed um, spillway modification. Basically what we're doing is going inside, this is, the spillway is actually a hollow, a uh, hollow structure in which the, uh, which we are able to access from the downstream side and construct a mass concrete structure, um, which will ultimately end up being the, the spillway itself at a crest elevation of 647. So the plan of approach is to come in, we will do some select demolition on the downstream face of the, of the spillway to gain access. And then we will be able to construct this, uh, this mass concrete spillway weir uh, really in the winter um, and, and not have much of an impact. So we'll be able to get this done very efficiently. Uh, as once this is completed, we will then um, look to basically demolish the upstream face exposing exposing this weir to to normal flows. Um, let's see. Next slide. So this is kind of a profile view of what we're looking at. So the hatched area at the bottom is the the spillway itself. Uh, there are two prominent center piers that will be left in place. This is to provide um, not only stability um, during the demolition process, but also to assist the contractor in, in uh, dewatering efforts to uh, facilitate the demolition of that upstream concrete face. So, and in, at this point, you know, we go dem kind of demonstrate um, what what this gives us the ability to do. So at elevation 647, if if we were to get an event uh, that would, uh, you know, basically rise, take a rise in the reservoir up to six, uh, I can't really see 640. So like six, Dan, if you want to go around the 660 line, that's just right below that pier, that center pier. Yeah. So right there, we'll be able to pass. A significant amount of flow through there, and then what I want to demonstrate is that we still have, you know, upwards of 20-25 feet of available storage, or really where the embankment is not being impacted by the reservoir, um, which the top of the dam is at 682. Uh, so by by effectively doing this. We are we're able to pass a lot of flow through through this existing spillway uh, and increasing the safety uh, and stability of the dam itself. Next slide. So this is a this is kind of our plan of approach of the downstream Titabal I see it, the uh, the aerial behind our our plan of pro is kind of blurred out, but uh, at the top of your screen is is the embankment, the dam embankment. And as we we're going to open up and stabilize that channel with a with a riprap stone kind of armoring and uh, basically a geotextile underneath, and that'll go along the left and the right side of that embankment and which will provide the stability for various flows uh, as it, it comes through the spillway and down the Tobacco River. Uh, 
Next slide, please. So Dan mentioned what we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at several areas that were initially identified in the reservoir body itself that may need additional stabilization with this lowered reservoir water level. And that'll, that'll be accomplished either with a, a stone slope protection or a basically a, a geofabric uh, turf reinforced mat approach and this will be at select locations we'll work with Dan's team to to identify which areas that will need to be uh, protected and uh, we'll be able to uh, accomplish that with one of these two methods next slide nope that's it all right thanks Paul um, and one other Thing that I wanted to mention uh, with that design um, is what, what, what the actual change in water surface elevations will be uh, within the, the impoundment. Um, so currently uh, the water surface elevation is somewhere between 660 and 662. Um, we'll be dropping that spillway elevation to about 647. Therefore the water uh, for the impoundment will probably actually be somewhere between 648 and 649. So we're looking at, you know, a 12, 13 foot uh, drop in that water surface elevation. So just wanted to add that clarification. Um, so with that, that does wrap up uh, my portion of it on the, um, uh, the emergency action and the design. Uh, Jim, I guess I'll hand it back over to you. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, why don't we, uh, I guess the next speaker we have coming up here is uh, Bob from uh, MDOT. So are you there, Bob? Gotcha. Sam. Hello, my okay. name is Bob Rank. I'm the region engineer for MDOT. Um, I cover all the construction design, the emergency response, uh, anything that has to do with the state roadway in 15 counties, including uh, Midland, Gladwin, Iosco, and um, Aranac counties and Saginaw, all those counties. Um, not to rehash, uh, when we had the initial event, we were uh, had about 23 MDOT roads and bridges closed in that short period after the event. We were uh, looking at in both uh, inspecting those bridges and uh, closing bridges as the water uh, levels went out to the uh, Lake Huron. Uh, so it, whenever we have to close a uh, bridge, we have to have it uh, thoroughly inspected. So that it takes a little bit of time. Um, overall, we had about 115 locations when you add uh, all of them up in the transportation system and all those counties. So immediately to go through some of the projects that we had, uh, we had the US 10 over Sanford Lake. That was the uh, freeway portion. We immediately uh, started a um, emergency design for that. We got that uh, about a three million dollar project, and that was um, bids were opened on June fourth, and it was um, opened by June twenty fifth. We then um, had to start a uh, debris removal contracts, um, both on the, the local network and on M thirty bridges. Uh, so those uh, debris removal contracts would remove all the trees. Uh, and all of the debris on top of the South Edenville Bridge, including removing the old Causeway Bridge that was uh, in, the, in the channel. Um, once we did that project, we were uh, working on the next, we had the footings inspected and worked on the next one, which was the M30 in Edenville. We uh, designed that ourselves in our emergency response area and the um, road, we led a project that was about 1.3 million to get that more of a temporary fix for about three to five years to get it open. And then we opened that to traffic on September 17th. We then were working along with um, the village of Sanford. Uh, MDOT had many forces out there, designers. We had consultants on board. Um, we were uh, looking to help out the locals. So we started doing the design work and the approaches 
for the bridge, including the um, rehabilitation work needed for the, the bridges in Sanford in the village. Uh, we had about a $650,000 project. Um, we mobilized in September 25th and we opened it on October 30th. Then um, we were in conjunction with that, we were working with um, Midland County Road Commission on the M30, excuse me, on the Curtis Road Bridge. And that project was uh, a lot of, we had to do a lot of more, a lot more engineering work, but we end up uh, putting a low bid together uh, through the emergency contracting process for about $1.2 million. And we just opened that this morning. Um, then um, we had we had to go back to US 10 at the freeway and the, the lowered water elevations of the river was cutting more underneath the footing areas. Uh, and we had to do some preventive measures, um, a very expensive preventive measure, about, um, about $2 million, but we ended up having to um, put a weir in, which basically stabilizes the, the um, bottom of the lake so we can have uh, no more erosion to happen. Uh, that work is scheduled to be done on the 21st of November. So we're gonna have the ramp and the removal of all the, all the traffic control devices and all that stuff by uh, November 21st. Um, the, the next and the last bridge that we are working on, as, as Dan and others uh, talked about, we had been coordinating with uh, a lot of hydraulic information, soils information, um, engineering analysis, uh, what what's could happen, what, you know, looking at all of the things that are needed to happen engineering wise and studying that whole area because you can't work at something in a vacuum. Uh, the Causeway Bridge was so close to the uh, tobacco side um, dam that we had to work together. When we got all the information needed to um, be ready to build the temporary causeway bridge, we immediately started designing. Our own forces designed that. Um, the old bridge was about 60 feet long or so. Um, the new temporary bridge structure is going to be 230 feet long. So as you can imagine, this is a very complicated structure, even though it's temporary. Um, but we have the now just finished the plans in less than a month. We have a an average short advertisement period where we're going to be advertising for bidding, and we're going to bid the project on November 24th. So that will mean once we get all of the the contractor gets all of the information together, all the mobilization, all that kind of stuff to get uh, to move out there. It'll be the first week of December. We will start work on the Causeway Bridge. Um, there's going to be a lot of work happening on that because it, even though it's a temporary structure, you have uh, more permanent um, design of, of piles, sheet piling, um, uh, H piling, different things to stabilize it because the, with the potential of um, erosion, we have to go as deep as we you would in a normal structure. So not only will we be working on the foundation work, we'll be working on the sheet piling wall. We'll also be coordinating with utilities. And then um, the temporary bridge is going to be coming in segments. It's really a bolt together structure. Uh, it'll be um, a steel structure with with some uh, different trusses on the side as it as it goes across, the this temporary bridge is set to be. It'll be about a. It could be there for up to ten years if we needed to. So we designed the bridge to handle any situation that needs to happen, uh, whether it be the water levels where they are, water levels lower or the, if the lake levels get back to where they were. Um, once we have a, some major decisions made um, in the area, MDOT will then 
program projects, including a new bridge to replace a temporary bridge in the causeway and one in Edenville uh, when that time comes. So I wanted to, that was about all I wanted to discuss. Um, and this will be the last stru structure that we'll have to be able to open things up. Um, it, it started to take a little bit longer in the design and because securing funding, uh, the time for us to have the um, projects 100% funded by the uh, federal government um, expires as of tomorrow. So we will be contributing uh, some of the money towards this uh, last project in the temporary bridge. That's all I have. All right, thanks, Bob. Um, all right, so we've got a lot of people uh, that have chimed in with some questions. Uh, before we go to questions, I wanna have our panelists that are here with us today. Uh, go ahead and turn on your cameras and we'll do some quick introductions for those who have not spoken yet. So I see Dan there. Um, so uh, Luke, you wanna say hi? <laughs> sure, I'm uh, Luke Trumbull. I'm also with the dam safety program. I, uh, uh, Dan's counterpart, I, I cover the Southern Lower Peninsula. Um, but uh, not including Midland and Gladwin counties typically, but I'm uh, been deeply or largely involved with this project and um, uh, also in the permit application review um, that will have to happen so that we can allow this work to go forward. Thanks, Luke. Uh, we already talked to Paul, Jared. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jared Sanders. I'm the Assistant Division Director in Water Resources Division. So I oversee the permitting programs uh, including dam safety program um, that uh, certainly involves a lot of this project. So glad to be here. Okay, thanks, Luis. Hello everybody, uh, Luis Aldivia. I um, work in the field operation section, uh, Lakes Michigan and Superior. I am part of the team that is uh, reviewing the permit application that has been submitted for this project and working uh, to with a team from Eagle and DNR and other federal agencies to go through the review process uh, that is required here. Uh, glad to be here and uh, answer any questions that anyone may have tonight. All right, thanks guys. So we do have quite a lot of questions here and just to let everybody know we've got about 366 people logged in listening. Uh, let's take a look at some of these first ones that came in. Um, this person's asking, what are your concerns about the citizens that do not want the dam restored? How has, how has that been addressed? So Dan, we'll start with you. Yeah, so um, other panelists may have some additional comments, but uh, as Teresa had mentioned early on, um, the long-term disposition of the, the dam is something that uh, has uh, basically quite a process that's going to have to go through. There's there's currently a lot of uh, uh, litigation uh, that's ongoing, um, and uh, in addition to that, there's the forensic investigation uh, component uh, where they're they're looking into the causes of the failure, um, and that that will feed into that as well. Um, and then ultimately, there will be a, a very public process for uh, making a determination on what's going to happen. Uh, but that is going to be driven. Uh, by by the community and by uh, the stakeholders. Okay. Uh, it, yeah. Let me let me jump in on that on that quick, Jim. So I mean, there there was a fair amount of questions about that. I mean, ultimately, what is going on here, um, as Dan mentioned, like the decision about um, you know whether the dams are going to be restored is going to be done through the community. We have will have a permitting role in that. But what we're talking about, whatever the disposition of that is, is years down the road. And in the interim, we have an unsafe condition with a bunch of water backed up behind a dam that is not in structurally good condition. And so these steps are really not tied to or intended to be part of any type of restoration effort. This is about in that window until this we hit that final disposition, protecting the downstream communities from, from a secondary failure. Dan, I think you said, is it 30 feet of water still backed up behind the tobacco side? So, I mean, 
that's what this project is about is get, taking some of the pressure off of that dam and building in capacity. So in springtime, when we get high flows again, um, you know, in that, in that interim period till there's some kind of final resolution, it's as, it's as safe as it can be for those downstream communities. So. Uh, with the new design for Wixom Lake, is Midland at more risk of flooding when compared to pre-dam failure? So uh, the Army Corps of Engineers did take a look at uh, evaluating uh, the, the rainfall and flood scenarios, we'll say through or along the Titabawasi River. Um, I guess one of the, what we've generally found, um, uh, and I don't have all the, the data readily available, but um, generally for the larger flood events, so, you know, our hundred year flood, which is kind of our regulatory flood event, um, th there likely won't be that much of a change in um, flood impacts. However, at smaller storm events, you know, your one year, your two year uh, type flood events, those, uh, we could see some, some increases in, in flood, flood extents or uh, really the way it would probably be realized is uh, it, it'll seem like a more frequent uh, high water um, associated with those smaller storm events. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, also, sh should forgot to introduce uh, Matt Tomlinson is also here helping me out uh, behind the scenes, uh, helping me run the boards here. Uh, we're gonna go to a couple of people that have got their hands raised. So Matt, could you unmute Paula Cornell? Paula Cornell, you can go out and unmute your line on your end and you can ask your question. I actually have uh, two of them. Uh, I know this doesn't sound like Paula, but First question is, uh, where is the money coming from uh, to make those uh, changes that you're proposing this year? And then number two, I didn't see in your design where if the lake uh, returns to its normal level, how you'll bring that low, this new lower level back up. Uh, so first, I guess I'll address the, the funding side of it. Um, so for these emergency repairs, uh, a good chunk of it is actually going to be covered. Uh, well, 75% of it is going to be covered by um, NRCS through their uh, emergency watershed program. Uh, and so that, that program is also helping to fund uh, a lot of the um, uh, slope stabilization and um, culvert, uh, you know, or, or, or stream crossing uh, repairs around the, uh, the impoundment um, post failure. So uh, we'll be utilizing that same funding source. Uh, outside of that, um, it's uh, basically it's coming from, um, you know, the state, the state general fund uh, through an appropriation. Um, in regards to uh, the question about the difference in water levels now versus future, um, again, this project is going to intentionally lower the water levels within the impoundment. And as Jared uh, described that as a, a risk reduction measure to alleviate the uh, structural strain on the dam and the embankment. Um, uh, as far as, you know, future scenarios where, what, you know, the dam is being rebuilt and bringing water levels back up, um, you know, th this project uh, isn't really doing anything to work towards that. Um, I will say that, you know, we have, uh, um, you know, been in talks with Four Lakes Task Force, we've reviewed the engineering report that they uh, uh, published uh, earlier this summer uh, regarding uh, their uh, potential alternatives for reconstruction. Um, and I, you know, we can say that our project is not, you know, at a detriment to, you know, their potential future efforts. Um, but this project doesn't actually have any specific tie to uh, future um, uh, restoration uh, uh, initiatives. All right, thank you for your question. We're going to go next to uh, Terrence Hall. So, Matt, you want to unmute Terrence Hall? Terrence Hall, you can go out and unmute your line and ask your question.
All right. Um, not hearing Terrence, so we'll keep going down the line here. Maybe we'll chime in later. Uh, Dan Chalk. Dan Chalk, you're unmuted. You can go ahead and ask your question. Yes, uh, what is the projected completion date for the Causeway Bridge? Is Bob there? I'm sorry if I uh, didn't mention that. We are looking at the third week of February to be done with that. We believe we can get most of the done, what the information and most of the stuff done over the winter and we'll be opening it up as soon as we possibly can. If we have good weather, we'll open it earlier. Okay. All right, thanks, Bob. Let's go to Carl Kerr. Carl Kerr, you can uh, unmute your line and ask your question. Uh, yes, on the, t on the Tobacco River side, uh, the uh, design doesn't include pilings that uh, on the earthen part of the dam, I, I, uh, the spillway, uh, uh, is that is that just by choice or is it by design or what? Uh, yes to both. Um, I guess really more so fed by the analyses and the design. Um, and, and really what that came from was um, reaching a, a level where we can safely pass uh, the necessary flood flows. Um, so, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, regulatory requirements for safely passing uh, flood flows for different uh, dams based on their hazard classification and their size. And so uh, this project is lowering the impoundment level to a point where, where we can safely pass those flows, uh, given the, the capacity of the, the spillway. Um, you know, and then with that comes the geotechnical and, and structural analyses of the, the remaining embankment and, and structure. And, you know, we, we, we found that that remaining embankment with the lowered water levels and the lower flood elevations uh, would be able to sustain, um, uh, you know, provide appropriate factors to safety for that structure without uh, the need for installing uh, any sheet piling. All right. Thanks. So let's keep it moving. We've got a lot of questions coming here. Um, in reference to alternative B, by diverting the flow away from the M30 causeway, are you saying that the residents on the Tobacco River side will not have access to Wickham, Wixom Lake? Sorry. Uh, so the uh, there will not be water flowing from the Titabwasi side to the Tobacco side uh, after the um, uh, the project is completed. Uh, I, I'm sure, um, you know, the other means, you know, a a access is, would otherwise be achieved is, is, is certainly there. However, um, you know, everybody should also be aware of that at least currently uh, the property is owned by, by Boyce Hydro and is, is their property. All right. Uh, going to the board here, uh, can we, can we unmute John Stemple? John Stemple, I'm muting your line. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to applaud the uh, efforts of MDOT and the the folks that have been dealing with this i drove across the curtis street curtis road bridge today it's very nice uh very good uh to be able to do that um <clears throat> my questions are related to the you had mentioned the owner of the dams uh did not respond or provide the reports in a timely manner <clears throat> as directed what is being done to enforce the uh, orders of the uh, the department at the, at the state Eagle um, related to those uh, demands? Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, we're following right now the, the process of uh, addressing the issues that were uh, requested of the owner in the order. 
uh, which, which is what's laid out for us in the uh, statutes for our emergency order. Um, uh, as far as uh, you know, any, any additional ramifications uh, with the owner, there's, there's ongoing uh, litigation that it'll, it'll likely be handled through those, uh, those means. Yeah, I think I think that's good, uh, Dan. I, I mean, the bottom line is, is there there's, of course, um, as everyone's aware, there's all kinds of litig litigation surrounding this, this cannot wait for those things to be resolved. So that's why we're um, engaging and getting this project done um, to get the dam to a safe, as safe as it can be spot um, and not wait around for um, this to be settled in the courts. All right. Um, if Wixom Lake gets returned to normal level, how will this new lower level be modified to, to, to accommodate the additional 20 feet of water? Sorry, could you read that one again, please? Yes, yeah, so this person is saying, they're asking uh, if Wixom Lake gets returned to a, a normal level how will this new lower level be modified to accommodate the additional 20 feet of water? I, I think what that's getting at is again, the future, uh, you know, potential future plans for the, for the lake, which this, this project right now isn't addressing that. That's something that'll be uh, dealt with through a larger community process after, like, like we said, all of the litigation and investigations are done. Okay. And this other person is asking, I um, want you to clarify or confirm, it says, so the water level of the Titabawasi River upstream from this will be dropping even more. Is that correct? So that's a good question. Uh, so uh, on the Titabawasi side, not, we're not taking this immediate action on the Titabawasi side. That, that is part of the emergency order that will likely follow in the spring or summer. Um, and there will be a uh, a further drop in water level there. Uh, obviously, there's not much more that it can drop. Uh, it's it's a matter of feet on that side. Um, uh, and the extent of impacts realized on that side will be um, uh, fairly localized uh, to that very lower impoundment reach in the vicinity of the, uh, the dam and the breach. All right. Uh, this next person, this next question I think is goes to uh, Bob at MDOT. Um, they're asking why not just put in a permanent bridge? Um, we were working with the, at this time, if we were to put something in, we would have to um, know what the permanent situation is going to be out there as far as the uh, lake levels. If there's not going to be a lake, then we could do something different. Uh, we want, we would have to look at things um, on a global basis and uh, that would take a lot of work. We would have to look at all the bridges in the area and do that. So we did not believe that we should have to study that in that kind of capacity, that we would just uh, make a biggest temporary bridge as we can and get out of the way right now. And then in the future, uh, not be um, impacted or not be in the way uh, to have that happen. So that's how we could get it done right away in an emergency situation. Okay. Uh, another question on the board here is, is how will work you are going to do impact the ability to repair and replace the dams long term? Will your work make repairing or replacing the dams more expensive or extend the timeline for the dams completion? So like I had mentioned before, the, the work that we're doing, it's um, uh, we, we've been in coordination with Four Lakes Task Force. We've referenced and reviewed their um, uh, engineering analyses that they've done so far and the proposed work isn't going to be detrimental to their efforts. Uh, they were proposing uh, full replacement, so complete removal and replacement of those existing concrete structures. Um, so, so this isn't to the detriment of that, it, it, you know, it, as far as what ultimately they end up doing and the costs associated with that is something that's yet to be determined. All right, thanks. Let's go to our, the board for some more questions. People raised their hands here. Um, Carl Garbasic, Carl, we're unmuting your line. You can go ahead and ask your question if you'd like. Yeah, um, I'm 
just just so you're aware i'm i'm in favor of you know fixing the dam both dams um fully but but i was just wondering could you fix uh sanford dam and not fix edenville dam do you guys know that or so that I don't know, and to be completely honest with you, uh, from the dam safety standpoint, um, up until recently, we've actually had limited uh, engagement in regards to Sanford Dam because that uh, has been a, a high operating hydropower facility, and therefore under the regulatory authority of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, but uh, as far as a question of order of operation for restoration and things like that. Again, that's something that uh, is going to be addressed in the future by uh, the local stakeholders. All right, thanks. Another person or hand up is Paul Fitzpatrick. Paul, we're going to unmute your line for you. You can go ahead and ask your question. I'll meet on your end. Yeah, it just it just seems like the elephant in the room is the restoration of the lake. I get, you know, we're doing this, this, uh, uh, we're creating two lakes. It sounds like we're going to have the, the tobacco lake and then there the, the Wixom lake. And theoretically, you know, there's an awful lot of money going into this thing. I mean, great. You're able to put a patch on the tire, you know, but what about, what about the master plan? I want to see a master plan, get this, uh, this uh, fleet, the scumbag, uh, you know, that owns the dam, get get him, hang him by his thumbs. And why are we spending all this money from a state and a federal thing? And, and you know, this is just this incomplete to me, incomplete plan. So I, I certainly appreciate, um, you know, the sentiment that the, the challenge and Jared had mentioned this before, and I think I alluded to it in the presentation is the actions we're taking right now we're taking those because this is an emergency situation and it requires addressing immediately uh you know there is concern that come springtime if action isn't taken uh there's a high po high potential for another failure on the tobacco side and so you know the state feels that it's uh urgent and, and imperative that we step in and do something now uh, and there are um you know cost recovery methods through litigation and uh, you know Jared touched on that a little bit too. Uh, the the overall plan for the dams and what's going to happen in the long term um, isn't a decision that Eagle can make. Uh, we're not the owners of the dam and so that's something that the owners um, what what you know in in communication and coordination with all of the local stakeholders will have to make that determination. All right, let's go on. Another person with their hand up, uh, Rehan Mahmoud. We're on I'm muting your line. You can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Devon for an excellent presentation and all the information uh, that he's given us. My question is uh, what kind of uh, uh, water flow we can expect in Tobacco River after this new spillway, uh, it, you know, is made uh, through the seasons. I mean, is it going to be stagnant or is it going to have a heavy flow or what kind of levels will we expect downstream from the dam? So I, I would expect after this project is completed that downstream on the Tobacco River, you know, which is really only a little over a mile long before it uh, connects back up with the Titiblasi River. Uh, but through that stretch, you'll see uh, typical run of the river uh, flows. So, um, you know, anything coming in from upstream is what you will see downstream. Uh, so that'll include the, you know, the, the relatively low uh, flows during the summer and, um, you know, in the spring and during uh, rain events, you'll, you'll see those waters come back up. Um, so there, there, there is the possibility there could be some more natural fluctuations, um, particularly during lower flows than what uh, you had previously uh, experienced um, based on however uh, the dams were operated before, but um, uh, you know, it will be more natural flow condition. Hey Dan, can you, uh, so upstream, I'm not sure if this question was downstream or upstream, upstream there's still gonna be some amount of impoundment there, right? So. 
there obviously is flow through that impoundment, but it won't look like a river. It's going to look like a smaller, basically, impoundment, correct? That's correct. Yep, yep. So upstream, it will still be uh, an impoundment, albeit a, a much smaller impoundment. Uh, and then farther upstream, again, it, it, it will go, you know, be back into a river condition, uh, you know, up to Dale Road and beyond. All right, thanks. Uh, looks like Kelly Bax has got her hand up. Kelly, we're going to meet your line. You can ask your question. The reservoir, the reservoir, Spring Break, and meet your line. Hello, uh, Kelly Bax. I don't know, maybe I might have a little trouble with her line. Matt, let's go to the next person, uh, Chuck Hudler. Hello. Oh, wait, hey, hold on, hold on. Okay, hey, Ke Kelly, is this Kelly? Yes, it is. Okay, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, I was just at the uh, Gladwin County Commissioner's meeting, and the emergency manager, Bob, was actually there, and I asked him about when they lower the Tobacco River down, if it diminishes our wells and we lose our wells, will that be covered under FEMA? And we were told, no, because that is the state that's creating that issue. So when you brought up wells before, is there something that's set up right now to help people out with their well water? Hello? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Jared, do you want to tackle that one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, ultimately, right right now, there's not. It's it's a it's a fair question, and and I um and I think there are legitimate. I mean, that's obviously a legitimate concern, and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to downplay it. Right now, there is no fund or dollar amount set up at the state level to replace those wells. So, but the decision, you know, ultimately isn't, isn't done lightly. The circumstance is frankly that there is just, there isn't a, a right choice that might not impact anyone. Um, and, and so the safety of making this change and lowering the water level and taking the pressure on a dam that is not structurally sound um, you know, is, is probably the right choice. Unfortunately, there, there may be, you know, those, those well impacts, but there, you know, just to be honest, there, there's not like a, a state fund somewhere, um, that's set up to address that at this time. Okay. So what, you never put a cost figure on what plan B was, and you know, like on the different plants, what is the cost difference between plan B and plan D? What is the overall cost for plan B? And what's the difference between B and D? Uh, so I, I can tell you, you know, right now, um, actually I don't know if I can say, it's supposed to be announced uh, next week, but um, you know, we're looking at a couple of million dollars for plan B and uh, plan D, which was to try and rehabilitate the structure, you know, was on the order of like $30 million. Um, and, and that's not a complete rehabilitation. That's still just getting it good enough for now. Um, so an order of magnitude difference. Uh, and, and furthermore, like I said, really the time frame is what precluded us even considering alternative D any further. It simply wouldn't have been possible to complete uh, the design and construction for that alternative prior to spring runoff, uh, where we would have seen a higher probability of uh, potential failure. Um, it, it's also worth noting, too, you know, like Jared said, there, there, there were no easy answers uh, for this problem. And, you know, one of the things we had to consider is, um, you know, while we are lowering that impoundment further and there is risk that some wells may run dry. If we didn't do this and the dam failed, not only are we creating a flood downstream, but ultimately the impoundment would be fully drained at that point anyway, which would be completely lowering the remaining 30 feet. And so, you know, those same impacts to wells would be realized. All right, thanks. Uh, let's keep it moving here. Go on to uh, Chuck Hudler, who's got his hand up. Chuck, go ahead. You can meet your line. Yes, um, my question is, when the when the project's complete, and I and I think Dan, I think you might have answered this with a part of an earlier question, 
when the project's complete, the flow of water that's currently flowing from the tobacco side over to through uh, the M30 causeway into the Titabawasi will cease to flow um, and there, thereby stop, um, stop eroding and creating a new channel over to the Titabawasi or over to the Titabawasi side? That's absolutely correct. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, Stacy Daniels, go ahead. Uh, Stacy Daniels, we're going to meet your line, I think. Matt, can we unmute Stacy there? Okay, Stacy, you should be able to go ahead. Well, let's go then. Oh, Stacy, there. You can go ahead and ask your question. Looks like you're got it now. Okay, you can hear me now. Yes. Okay, I'm an environmental engineer from middle of night, a front row seat, living in the orchard subdivision with uh, Sturgeon Creek just down the hill from me. But I was curious. The original area of the four lakes, according to the DNR lake maps, seemed to be about a little over four thousand acres. And I'm just curious what the total volume of the four lakes were before the uh, Inundation this is Luke Dan I can probably I can probably we'll have to probably take that offline because I don't think we have those figures at our fingertips so I, I actually I do Luke do you not that I memorized them I saw the question on the screen earlier so uh, um, they the, the combined volume of all four impoundments was roughly uh, 120 acre feet um, that equates to about 5.3 billion cubic feet or 37 billion gallons. I was about in my ballpark too. I'd also integrated the uh, stage discharge from the USGS gauge. And uh, that came out to be somewhere between 80 and 142 uh, billion gallons, which uh, ranks at number one in the history of US inundations, if I calculate right. Okay. Thanks for your question. Uh, Lori Oriel, Lori Oriel, we're going to unmute your line. You can go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead, Lori. Well, must maybe a lot might, might have lost you there. All right, Matt, let's go to um, hand raise Nancy Bol Boland. Nancy Boland, you can go ahead and uh, ask your question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, this is Bruce Boland, uh, Nancy's husband. Okay. <clears throat> My property line ties right to the sea cord dam dike are they going to keep the water levels down while they're fixing the Edenville dam and Sanford dams or can they put the water level back up in Secor dam to bring the economy up in the Gladwin area and stuff so yeah. no. go ahead Luke I've been I've been chopping at the bit no I'm just joking um so Secord Smallwood and Sanford are all currently regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So the state of Michigan Dam Safety Program doesn't have uh, authority over uh, any safety requirements or uh, what's in place at Secord and Smallwood as uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commissioner FERC has directed uh, the dam owner to lower those impoundments until adequate assessment of the safety of the dams and uh, any repairs that come out of those assessments can be completed and it's deemed safe to restore the water level in those dams. So we don't have uh, authority over that. So we can't, can't look into the crystal ball and say when that's gonna happen. But uh, those, those uh, questions probably would be better directed to uh, FERC in Chicago 
or or the owner Boyce Hydro at this point um, as far as to get an updated timeline. So Thank Luke, you. I think that was I think that's a really good clarification. I just wanted to sort of jump on top of that and also I mean because we're getting a lot of questions about you know what are we going to do with the restorations and things like that and I think it's it's really important to note that you know right now the bottom lands and the dams are owned by Boyce Hydro and um, certainly Four Lakes Task Force is working with them and at some point that ownership you know um, may change hands um, but ultimately right now um, you know, we're taking a step that the law allows us to do to address an emergency, but these, you know, any of this long-term sort of decision-making about what's going to happen, a lot of that, frankly, is out of our, out of Eagle's control right now. And, and I know, I, I get that there's probably a lot of impatience uh, because you, you know, you folks have been impacted by this for a long time, but all of that stuff is gonna is gonna play out over the next months um, and years. Right now, we're just focusing on the small little piece that we control, which is the you know the ability to do an emergency project to secure this dam. All right, um, we're gonna go back to some of the questions that have been typed in. Um, how does the current situation with the Sanford Dam play into the safety of the downstream communities? In other words, are there any plans to stabilize the Sanford Dam in the near future? So again, this is um, not something that's currently under our regulatory authority, um, but uh, I guess we can say that, um, you know, we've been made aware of the fact that um, Four Lakes Task Force is currently working to uh, develop plans for stabilizing the remaining uh, dam site and embankment. Um, they're working uh, to the extent they can with, with FERC. Uh, they're not the licensee, um, uh, but they're they uh, working through that process. And then on top of that, uh, I think as Jared alluded to, uh, you know, trying to uh, work towards ownership, um, which would allow them uh, to, to, to address those issues fully. Okay, and another question, some related. Uh, why not work with Four Lakes Task Force now for a joint project? Um, so they're saying yes, it's there. Yes, theirs is longer, but both are needed. Seems like wasted efforts and funds in the state's part. So again, we've been collaborating with Four Lakes Task Force throughout this whole process, um, and we're in regular communication with them. Um, uh, you know, to a certain extent, they're even. I don't know if we want to say partnering on this project. Um, uh, they're the sponsor for the NRCS uh, uh, grant program. And so we are working with them um, uh, through, through that funding. And so, uh, as Jared mentioned, you know, this is an emergency project and that's why we're stepping in and, and doing this work. Uh, if this was not an emergency situation, we would not be engaged in this manner. Um, and so that's, that is the, the, the only reason that we're really pushing forward with this project and, and it is time critical. Yeah, and, and to, be, to be direct about it, there isn't time to do more than this. We're, you know, the bottom line is, is we feel the project and the engineering review suggests the project needs to be done before we get our spring flows. So some you know, major restoration project, Dan talked about this, is not happening before the spring. We got to get this thing buttoned up um, so it can handle spring flows. Okay. Uh, I got a couple of questions about erosion. Um, this person's asking for the properties that will require additional reinforcement to assist with potential lakeside erosion, who will pay for it? Some of the property owners were told they would have to pay up to $5,000 per property. So that, 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 that is. Um you know, an issue that I know uh, Four Lakes has been working with a lot of the property owners uh, within the impoundments uh, uh, regarding uh, currently ongoing erosion issues. Um, I will say as far as uh, this project, this emergency project, this dewatering from that elevation 662 down to 647 roughly, uh, the state will be looking at impacts due to that further dewatering. 
uh, to ensure that you know our project isn't uh, inducing any other detrimental impacts uh, within the 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 uh, bottomlands or the the impoundment. Um, but that doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily going out and addressing uh, issues that are already or that have already occurred due to the failure. Um, and so that's something I know, like I said, Four Lakes has been working with property owners. Um, obviously, you know, they, they've indicated to the property owners that you mentioned that they, they have some, um, some obligations there as well, but that's, that's probably to be taken up with them uh, best. Okay, going back to my hands that are raised and we got quite a few still. Um, we're gonna try to unmute Donna Wells. Donna Wells, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Just a second, it's coming. You're, you're good, go ahead. I know everybody's talking about how long it's gonna take and all this other stuff, but is anybody ever looking at what, the, not having the, the four lakes that are going, what the economy is gonna do for the Gladwin and Midland counties? Jared, uh, Jared, you're muted. muted. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, certainly there are there are catastrophic impacts caused by this. I mean, um, I don't know what studies have been done to look at the economics. Because ultimately, we, that that isn't. I mean, ultimately, that isn't Eagle's role in this. For the most part, we're a regulatory agency. In this particular case, we are stepping in to make a safety change but um but if you're going to you know, spend yeah, all that money just to to temporarily fix it wouldn't it be better to be able to put that money to permanently fix it uh you, i think we would love to have a, a permanent fix in place whatever that that's that's going to be that's that's not feasible right now so what we have <laughs> is the ability to do an emergency who determines that so again, I guess I'll go back to that alternatives analysis that we were looking at and looking at not even a permanent solution, but we'll call it a, um, a, rest, a, a quasi restoration pro, uh, a solution where we were going to be rehabilitating the, the, the embankment. Um, it, it doesn't even fit into the time frame that we have where we could be faced with Further failure of this dam and, a, and another catastrophic flood. That time frame precluded a, 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 a greater rehabilitation process for the dam right now. And then, furthermore, like Jared was saying, uh, you know, the long-term disposition, the, the restoration of these dams, isn't even a decision that that Eagle has the authority to make. You know, that's something that the owners and the stakeholders and the community need to, um, you know deliberate on and, and work through their process and come to a, a, an appropriate decision there. All right, thanks. We got a ton more questions here. So I wanna to try to get as many as I can in with the short time we got left here. Uh, Mary Richards, let's go ahead and uh, unmute Mary Richards line. Go ahead, Mary Richards. Are you there? Yes. All right question is it's when you go to build the new bridge over m30 are you going to have to remove the old before you can install the new and what kind of time frame are you looking at to build the new bridge because they're saying if they bring the dams back it'll be four to six years we will be in line with that if it, whenever you um, they have some type of permanent solution, we will then remove the temporary bridge and then design for a new bridge. We'll know all the information like how high we need to be, how long we need to be, and um, it'll be a permanent solution. I can tell you it's gonna be larger and wider and longer for sure, um, just because of the uh, new standards that they have. Um, so that's, that's what the plan is. Uh, as you know, we can we can mobilize right away, but there'll be a, a bunch of planning that happens on the way to that uh, solution. 
But in that case, so in other words, you're going to have to tear this one out. So it'll be back down for a temp for a significant amount of time while you rebuild the new one, correct? It'll only be during the construction phase though. We can leave that temporary bridge in as long as we can. But as you know, we will have to close it uh, for a certain period of time. But typically that's a season or two to get the work done itself. Uh, we will have a, a better signed detour and um, we'll have a much better of a plan together in the long term. Okay, as you would say. All, All right, right, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to next person hand up, uh, David Trombley. David, go ahead. What about the Edenville Dam? Edenville. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I'm assuming you're referring to the uh, um, the Tittabawassee side. That's also commonly known as the Edenville Dam. Okay. Um, and uh, as as I mentioned in the presentation, we do have. Uh, a plan under the emergency actions that will restore flow to the uh, Titabawassee River downstream of the dam, uh, uh, whereas currently the river is diverted through the dam breach. Um, uh, but like I said, that uh, just one, because we need to complete the tobacco side first so that we can control the flow of water better. Um, that has to wait, which means it'll be spring or summer when that uh, construction starts. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks. Oh, um, it's got a few more minutes left our meeting. I want to take a few more questions here from people. So, uh, P. Magerl, P. Magerl, that's what you're signed in as. Could we're going to meet your line? Go ahead. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, hi. I uh, I submitted some text questions, but I thought I'd raise my hand as well. I was wondering if you had modeling that predicted what the water level and the flow would be downstream on the Tobacco River, uh, if there was a dam failure on the Tobacco Dam. And I know there's a lot less water now, but would it be catastrophic? Would it be, would we see the deforestation? Um, a, a similar question, your work to, uh, to work on the dam and to fix it and restore the river flow, is there going to be a, a sudden increase in flow downstream and how much? And if that's the case, how are you going to notify the downstream residents uh, when or before the flow is reintroduced into the tobacco river? Those are, those are really great questions. Uh, so first of all, the, um, we, we did do, we'll, we'll say some very coarse uh, analysis of what a dam breach would look like uh, in terms of uh, flow volume. And uh, in the immediate vicinity of the dam, it, it would be very catastrophic, much like what you saw on the, um, you know, on the original failure. The difference is because, um, you know, we're only dealing with half of Wixom Lake and, and the tobacco side. Um, that flood wave dissipates as you move downstream and quite frankly would have very minimal impact down beyond Sanford. Um, the, I, am I still unmuted? You're still unmuted, yes. So would it impact the residences on the Tobacco River? It the absolutely flood? would, yes. And would so that, 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 that is the primary concern for why we are implementing this emergency project, you know, as well as the other uh, residents uh, in the close proximity on the Tibet or on the Titabalasi and uh, some of the downstream infrastructure. Um, additionally, in regards to your question about the uh, rate of uh, flow or rate of rise, currently there is no flow on the Tobacco River downstream of the dam. Uh, so certainly when they start to divert flow, you know, you'll immediately start seeing water moving and then the water will start to rise. Uh, there certainly will be a process with the contractor of notifying adjacent property owners so that they are aware of when that uh, activity begins to occur. Um, and then furthermore, as part of the construction, uh, similar to when the dam was in full operation, the construction contractor will have an emergency action plan, uh, which they will um, have exercised or practiced uh, prior to construction starting, uh, that they'll also be able to, um, uh, you know, implement if, if anything does arise during construction. All right. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Um, 
One more question from the board here, Matt Hopfer. Matt Hopfer, you got your hand up. We're going to unmute your line. You can go ahead and ask your question. All right. He might not be have access to his microphone. Um, and as we uh, go through these questions here, you guys, we got a ton of questions that were typed in. I mean, we've well, we have over 300 people logged in today, so of course we get a lot of questions, and we try to address a lot of them. Try to get to a lot of people that are hands raised, especially give everybody a chance to ask um, that wanted to voice their question. Uh, we got quite a few more that have come in. Um, you know, we're we're at our like end time here for our meeting, and I'm just going to reach out to my team here online and see if there's anything specific you guys want to address. Um, this list of questions that um, before we start to wrap it up here, um, Dan or Jared, Luke, anybody? Um, a lot of people with concerns about the lake levels um, after and when they're going to return back and those types of things. Um, Jared, could you maybe walk through um, just real quickly the process that it takes to go from um, a change of ownership, let's just pretend there's a change of ownership and what it will take to get the dams uh, kind of put back into play. A lot of people are questioning about dredging and weed growth and tree growth and things like that and just kind of lay out the process there. Yeah, um, sure, I can do that. So um, there might be a few holes in here, so I'll, I'll lean uh, on my team to jump in and help out a little bit. But um, I mean, we're looking at you know, what Teresa was talking about there is, I mean, we're looking at a multi-year, um, you know, process to get to the point where there's a final resolution of this. It, it's, it's, you know, it's no secret at all for Lakes Task Force. And there's a lot of folks that are uh, working on a restoration uh, project, but, um, you know, even in the best of terms, that's, you know, I think a, even one of the um, callers or attendees mentioned like four to four to six years down the road. Um, we have already worked with Four Lakes on doing a sort of a recommendations document for vegetation management. Um, what Dan has mentioned several times, we're engaged with them. We are working with um, we are working with them uh, on a, sort of a management plan for all of these interim sort of steps, including vegetation management. So that's one of the things that they're working on. They certainly have a lot of pots in the fire and are working feverishly to deal with um, those issues. And again, we're partnering with them. I want to be careful about, you know, how um, I say that. I mean, ultimately, we are the regulatory agency. And so if the dams are going to be uh, put back in, that would involve a getting a permit through us. At this point, um, that is, you know, I don't enter. There are still ownership questions. There's still, you know, the engineering work. There's, there's, you know, we're at the very start of uh, what is, you know, probably a marathon in terms of um, that decision making, but. You know, at the end of the road, if there if there's an application and and ownership changes and financials and everything come through, there will be a permit app in front of us. And and there's sort of three main things that the department would look at. The department is not going to be advocate one way or the other. Again, we're the regulatory agency, so our decision is going to be you know on the long term implications would be based off of what the um, what the statutes say. There's sort of three main components of things that we would look at. One of them is um, flooding and water movement. So floodplain issues, both upstream and downstream of the project, the environmental, natural resources um, impacts, and then the safety piece. Uh, again, but I don't want to spend too, you know, the, I've really tried to steer away from jumping into that because those types of decisions are going to be made um, quite a ways down the road and whatever that end project looks like is going to be driven by the local um, communities. Eagle's not going to make 
the decision about what the ultimate outcome is here. Outside of, we have a role to make sure that whatever that looks like, that meets um, state laws and statute. So I don't know if I hit exactly what you were after, um, Teresa, but really what, you know, what we're here and what we want to focus on, uh, you know, today and what this was, I mean, there, you know, we can do more of these and I'm sure we will over time as, as the area is trying to recover. Um, I really feel like this has been a good way to get information out, but um, really what we're, what we really wanted to get out there today was an awareness that this emergency project is um, you know, essentially is, is, is going to happen. So people understand why and what we're doing. And, and certainly we heard some questions and criticisms of that tonight. Um, but at the, at the heart of it, the issue is there's an unsafe dam that is still impounding 30 feet of water. That's a risk to people downstream. And, you know, frankly, in good conscience, we believe that we need to we need to address that situation in a very short time window before spring spring flows hit. So, um, I don't know if I hit the mark, but I hit a lot of stuff there. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. I think you know your comments sum up to the purpose of this meeting because we got questions all over the board. You know, in terms of lots of different things, but the purpose of this meeting was is exactly what you just talked about. So, um, you know, thanks for doing that. Uh, you know, I, I apologize we didn't get to get, get to everyone's questions. We had a lot. Um, Jared, Luke, and Dan, I, I will share these with you, a list of questions we got. So if that's something you need to get back with somebody directly on, you can do that if you'd like, um, if you can. Um, that way everybody has them. Uh, we did record the webinar tonight. So if you want to pass along to somebody that didn't get to see it, um, I'll send an email to everyone that registered and a link to the recording as soon as it's posted up on our YouTube channel. Uh, it happened next day or so. Um, I don't know, Jared or Dan, Luke, anybody from our team have any last minute comments you guys want to make before we, we wrap this up for tonight and let, let, let everybody go? Okay. I'm good. Thanks. Thanks. All man. right. That's fine. I always like to leave it open for someone from our team if you want to make last minute comments. So, hey, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thanks to our team here uh, from MDOT, from Eagle, of course and from AECOM for being here to answer questions and presenting tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us. Like I said, I had a lot of people on, a lot of good questions that came in. Um, thank you for taking some time out of your evening to uh, spend to learn about this topic and hopefully get some of your questions answered. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>